Well, good morning, my beautiful sister. Well, good morning, Natalie. It's so nice to see you again. It is. And we've got a great guest today. I'm yeah, excited. Right. We've got a guest. We yep. got a guest and she is like awesome. She is. I am ready to get rolling. Oh, me too. You know, I like how you just said, I'm ready to get rolling. Let's no, do it. Let's turn today. Get I know right it. To I'm it. like, I, this is a good story. We don't this have This is a good waste. story. Don't waste our time with talking yeah. about us. JJ, tell yeah. us uh, yeah. about the amazing Casey <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> okay, so... I mean, this is an important series, Heroes Being for Heroes, and she's got a lot of heroes in her family, so let me tell you. Mm. Um, so today, guys, we have Casey Kelly with us, and Casey grew up in Southern California. She has a background in environmental science and education, and she also has a heart to serve. She served at AmeriCorps, and she worked in the nonprofit sector before meeting her husband, Stephen. We're going to talk about how they met, because that's a really fun part that's of their story. story. Today, she's a wife. She is a mom to two boys, four dogs, three cats, and 14 chickens. And she is a caregiver. Mm -hmm. Casey says her caregiving journey is slightly ambiguous. Stephen was in an IED explosion in 2012. She began advocating for his care as soon as he arrived home from Afghanistan, but did not officially become his caregiver until he was medically retired in October of 2012. In the two years since, Casey has worked through Stephen's TBI and PTSD diagnosis that mirrors dementia at times, the loss of a tremendous support person, and homeschooling her two boys mm. with some interesting distractions that actually keep the family focused. Casey, we are so glad you're here today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, you know, Casey looks, so, if you get to, you should watch this on YouTube because Casey looks so beautiful today. And JJ I and I, we are not so much. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I, I don't get to dress up very often. Oh, I love it. Bro. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be posting like Casey everywhere because oh, we're right. like, wow. And she's a caregiver. She has all these people that she's responsible for and all these things that she does. And we're like, wow. So you she has pulled us together. So we are ready. So um we would be remiss starting any of this by uh, not letting you tell the background. We're not going to jump forward this time. We're going to say <laughs> we must hear about you and your husband and how this story all started. So uh, Stephen and I met while he was playing third wheel on a, on a pity date. I didn't want to go on. Uh, my girlfriend's <laughs> had to push me out the door. I was that against going to see this guy. And uh, he asked me to meet him in the local Walmart. Oh, wow. Walmart. Yeah, in the fishing section. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the story. Right. And he was toting Stephen with him. Hmm. So that's how we met. And <sighs> Stephen knew how absolutely uncomfortable I was with this guy I didn't want to be around him and he just made me laugh the entire night and I was you know into that I was like yeah I I think I've found him <laughs> and he was the third wheel <laughs> and you found your lobster now was Stephen Stephen was in the military at that point wasn't he he had just joined so this was his first duty station. He had just arrived. He had only been there for a month. So where, where were you guys? From? Yeah. Where yeah. were you? Washington state. So we were, um, I was going to school in Olympia. I was going to Evergreen mm -hmm. and he was stationed at Fort Lewis McCord. Okay. So, right. and he's from upstate New York. So oh. how the two of us, yeah. So opposite sides of the country, Southern California, the more the most southern you can get and the, the you know northern new york how the two yes. of us met <laughs> in the most <laughs> random place washington state of all places and so then, you, and then she were, ended up in virginia so that's gonna be I know, another story right? well, entirely because virginia's for lovers that's true but, that's yeah. true. but you know but you guys were puppies too when you met right you were in how old were you uh 25 both of us are tw yeah we were babies. We were puppies. Babies. I mean, in the in the military world, we were old. But yeah, that's true because <laughs> your most of your enlistees come in at. So that's interesting. He enlisted at what? Uh, then at 25, 24, 24. 25. Yeah. So 
I, I have to know what was the delay? What did he do from 18 to 24? Was he just messing around in New York, living his best life? You don't have to say all the deets, but you know, literally messing around. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. just, so something happened that he was like, that's yeah. it. I'm going to, I'm going to do yeah. 2012. Okay. Yeah. He actually joined the service um, to support his kids. Wow. So he wasn't, yeah. So he has uh, children outside of our marriage and mm -hmm. He could not financially support them mm -hmm. because he didn't have a degree. So he was just like, okay, what do I do? So I'm going to join the army to make sure my kids are taken care of. They have medical and they have insurance or, well, they have insurance and they have yeah. finan financial support. So he yeah. did this for his children. Wow. That's, that's interesting. And I'm going to tell you, I'm sure he's not the first. Yeah. I mean, no, no. It. I mean, people do know, but I think what an incredible, yeah, what an incredible gift, you know, like I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like, that's very giving and very self, you know, uh, you know, selfless. I you would know. agree with that, Casey. I would agree yeah. with that as well. Yeah. So you guys, so, and there's a little bit this, cause this story is interesting because keep going. So you guys, um, get married after dating for how long? Six months. <laughs> Love this. So she just, I wish you guys are going to have to watch this on YouTube because she just shrugged her shoulders. It was really cute. She's like, <laughs> yeah. We, and then, but I guess when you, you know, when you know, you know. So yeah. it was kind of like, why wait? And in the, in the military, things move quickly in relationships. So yeah. Yeah. literally uh, somebody said that yesterday. Similar <laughs> kind of thing. And our, so the baby sister, we're sorry, Emily wasn't able to be here. Um, and so same for her. I mean, she had known her husband. She was married to the Air Force. And I always joke that she was okay. married to the Air Force. And so, but you're right. Military moves fast. And I think that's for, for, you know, for, for our listeners, you know, this is like imp important to know if you don't know someone like it is a fast paced life and yeah. it is unpredictable life as you know, extremely. You, yeah. And so, so you all met and then you got married after six months and then what happened? <laughs> and then he deployed to Afghanistan just a few months after that. Yeah. Uh, the day before he went to Afghanistan, we found out that we were pregnant with our first, first baby. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. it, it was crazy. Wow. Wow. So, so you, and, and so then you're, go, you're, and, and I'll say this because pe people won't know this. Emily was pregnant with Owen while her, um, and, and Emily, every, Emily has an ex-husband while her ex-husband was deployed. I wish Emily was here to say that because she, she would be like, girl. Right. I, that I know hard. there's so many women that go through it. I was lucky. I was lucky that he got to come home. Um, right. A captain had given up his space for him to come home so he could be home for the birth of the baby. Wow. So, uh, yeah, we have we have we are the luckiest in in, in some terms, yeah. you know. You got good, wow. it ebbs and flows. And so yeah. you're, you're pregnant and cause I, cause yeah, I'm like, yeah, I guess I've heard Casey's story a little bit before. And so that's why I'm so excited because we get to dive deeper. Um, <laughs> and so you're pregnant during this time and who's your support? I mean, because who's your support? So they have sent me back to Southern California. Okay. okay. Um, my mom was pretty much my support system. I had my siblings there, okay. um, but I was back in my mom's home, uh, putting a baby bassinet together in the room I grew up in, mm -hmm. uh, thinking I'm going to have a baby and I'm going to be pretty much like a single mom. There's no way my, my husband's going to come home for the birth. So I'm thinking I'm going to have this baby in California and that's going to be it. And that is not what <laughs> happened at all. Okay. Uh, I'm, I literally got a call and I was told if you can be in Washington in 20, in 72 hours, we'll send him on a plane home. So what happened? So why, why, why do we have to get back to Washington? Because, um, that's his duty station. Okay. So, um, I left the duty station to be with family, to get support while I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so 
move going back was the only way that they would send him forward. Gotcha. They always okay. say sending forward, sending yeah, forward. Right. Right. Um, so that that's the only way that they would that they would send him home. Gotcha. And so I had to, my best friend jumps in the car with me and drives me because I'm too big to get behind the steering wheel. And my best friend drives me all the way back to Washington State. So he that is, they were sending him home because of he had been involved in the IED explosion, correct? No. No, not they yet. They kept him in Afghanistan. So, so tell me. So that- I was. Go ahead. So I was about five to six months pregnant when he was in the IED explosion. Okay. Um, July 22nd, 2012. Okay. Mm-hmm. He was in the IED explosion. We'd only been married, goodness, for a few months, like uh, only, not even a year. Okay. And um, I got a phone call and it was him. Normally it's supposed to be the military calling you. Mm-hmm. And so I I get, I get a phone call. Are you sitting down? And I'm like, oh God, oh God. And I, I'm thinking, okay, he's alive because he's talking to me. Right. But what's going to happen? Who from his squad is gone? What happened? Mm -hmm. And he goes, are you sitting down? Is your mom next to you? And I'm like, and my mom looks over at me and she goes, oh, shit. Sorry. (laughs) You're good. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, So he then goes, I was in an IED explosion today. They think I have a TBI. Um, I can't be on the phone very long. Can you call my mom and dad? And then he said, I love you. And he hung up the phone. Wow. Yeah. Like if you want to know how caregiving starts, it's in that second. It's in the, because people will think it's like the activity. It's in that second, that split second of something significant. Um, And it's different for everybody, but it was the same way. Jason walked in. How'd it go? They think I have cancer. In that moment, your life changes and you are five months pregnant. Yep. So of course my mom's looking at me going, put your feet up, do something. Do not bring that stress onto that baby because yep. that's really important. And and I'm like, oh my God. So then I get a call a couple of weeks later saying, this is the United States Army. Your husband's been in an explosion. And I'm sitting here going, oh, my God, again. So I'm losing my mind thinking, oh, my God, he's been in another IED explosion. Mm-hmm. But he hadn't. Uh, he had just been they, they they just took forever to notify me. So I want to okay. make sure it's clear. I got to get my storyline straight here for a second. He calls you. Uh, in July, July 22nd. Mm -hmm. And he says, you get 60 seconds equivalent is what it probably felt like. You get no real information. And then the military calls a couple of weeks later. Is there any conversations with him in between? Because he's still, you said he was in Afghanistan. Is there any conversations with him in between the later notification? Just FYI, in case you didn't realize your husband was in an explosion? Yeah. So we got to actually, while he was in the hospital, we got to talk all the time, which was rare because he hadn't been, we hadn't been able to communicate. So um, he actually spent his birthday, which was the day after he was blown up in the hospital. So he goes, the army gave me a birthday present. And, uh, and, you know, yeah, but he got to see, uh, we got to actually video call a few times when he got to the MWR. Okay. So we were keeping in contact and then they released him back to duty two weeks later. Okay. So he was, they diagnosed the TBA. They they said possible TBI. Um, He had some abrasions. Um, He had bit his tongue. And so he had a hole in his tongue. So they waited until all of that healed. He had, that's when he, that side of the vehicle where he hit, he hit his knee. Mm-hmm. Um, so they said possible TBI. And then they were like, okay, all done. And right. they sent him back to, and he he spent another six months in Afghanistan. Okay. So you get the call and you go back to Washington, I'm assuming. And the baby has been born. Your first son has been born. Yep. Or is born? So, okay. 
Yeah. So he comes, well, he made it home. He okay. made it home for the birth. Right. So, um, yeah. And a few weeks later, I just noticed, I'm like, something's not right. Okay. Okay. Um, we lived in an awful little house, you know, as you always do, you know, you live in an awful apartment or an awful little house when you first get it, get started. And, um, we just lived in this terrible teeny tiny little house. And, um, we brought Harrison, our oldest home, and we had neighbors who had this really awful loud party mm-hmm. and Steven, they were, stu- they shot off some fireworks Mm. and Steven crawled under the bed and I was like it's fireworks and then we had a really bad windstorm and um he stood over our son to try to protect him drenched in sweat panicked thinking that he was back in Afghanistan with the baby and so he was like hiding our son trying to trying to protect him and that's when i knew i was like something's not right so that's when it started casey like this this journey because steven's not out until 2021 so he's still active duty so you're you have a child you have a new baby during this time you all also have another son but what is these symptoms progress because where Stephen is now, when we've talked, he is, he's progressed to where the symptoms are, they almost mimic dementia. And so how has this, how has he progressed? What's going on with you? Because you're, he's in the military, you're caring for two kids. Tell us about that, that space. What's going on with you? Are you working? Oh, you. <laughs> Uh, so I worked, I, I worked on and off, um, yeah. getting stable work for a military spouse is extremely difficult. Exactly. Um, yeah, our, our higher rate, um, and employability rate is so much higher than the national average. Mm-hmm. So, and it's because nobody wants to hire anybody who won't be there long-term. Right. So, you know, I can go into a job. I, I have a degree. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I could go, I, you know, I've, I've worked in an industry, so I have experience and I was always told no. And the reason why was because it was like, once you get the hang of things, once you're in it, you're going to move. Yeah. So it was okay. Bye career. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, I wound up running um, a daycare inside my home when I lived on a military installation, Mm -hmm. hated that. Uh, We'll never do that ever again. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I've worked with kids before, but it was just, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a good situation. Mm -hmm. So, and then I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of contracting. Okay. So what I could get to scrounge up a little bit of something, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a lot. So we're living on one income. Yeah. Um, but Steven progressed, um, his progress or his progression was, um, the army never did any follow up so mm-hmm. their policy is to rescreen when they come back into country so they're supposed to be doing screenings when these guys come back mm-hmm. and unfortunately steven fell through the cracks mm-hmm. and so um i'm the only one sitting here begging saying something's not right somebody please help him yeah something's not right but out of fear he's just masking and masking and saying, I can get through this. If I can just get through the day, I'm fine. So, um, and I mean, there are climbing under the beds uh, when our neighbors are playing, um, they're really loud surround sound. And in the military, they're townhomes, so you're attached. So when your walls are shaking and your husband's under the bed, what do you do? So um, that's the that's the hard part about military life too. So he would start, he started in Washington state getting help and saying, I I need help. I'm so angry. Okay. And so he'd started, started counseling and then they'd move us. Um, For the army, a lot of families only average three years. We averaged two. Okay. So, um, he came back from Washington. Harrison was 
six or seven months old and we were at the next duty station. So we went to Kansas. We were there in Kansas for two years and he went back to the Middle East. He went to uh, Kuwait. I was afraid you were going to say, I was going to ask if he was deployed again. Yep. Well, yep, but there's so that, nothing, that there's nothing wrong, but let me ask you this. I mean, you said he went back to Kuwait, but like, what are the things that you're like, cause I want to make sure like, these are the things that are important because if they, especially if this mimics dementia or the, what these it doesn't even matter. It's a, he's got a, he's got PTSD probably. Well, I know he has PTSD. And so he was, I'm assuming he was undiagnosed PTSD. Yes, we know he had a TBI, but that was pretty much the limit. He goes to a clinician to to seek therapy. Some. What are you doing, like as a as a caregiver? Because you're dual role. You're not just wife at this point. How are you helping him to manage the symptoms? Or honestly, it sounds like to mask, hide, or to dampen the symptoms as much as possible. Cause I know you're, you're at that point, you're caregiving for him. Wives of military folks or spouses of military folks are absolutely caregiving to them because they've got, it's a different type of job experience. All right. Uh, so I honestly didn't know much about the TBI. I mm-hmm. thought it was mostly PTSD. Okay. So I was just, can you please, please go get help please go get help. And um, because I'm sitting here begging him to get help, because I know something's not right. I know he's triggered. I know there's things that aren't aren't happening. I'm just begging for help at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm begging him to get help because he's terrified that if he gets any formal counseling, that he'll be kicked out of the service. Gotcha. So there is is definitely stigma around mental health and service and is he on any medications yes oh yeah oh yeah (laughs) because typically there's medications are frowned from my understanding is and this is historical whether it's now or not place to place an individual experience we're not wanting i want to make sure we're not implying that this is status quo we are just saying this is casey's experience (laughs) yes Oh yeah. He, when he started taking medication. And so we went from Washington to Kansas in Kansas, he did start counseling. They actually um, come to find out years later. um, They wanted to start processing, processing him for a medical retirement then. Okay. We did not know. So it was a doctor later, years later, who was going through his medical history, who said, I see that they were trying to start the med board process then. And they kept him in the army for six more years. Wow. So, so, um, keep keep going. He was, yeah. So he was being seen at the TBI clinic in Kansas and nobody told us he was in the TBI clinic in Kansas. They just said it was regular counseling. So, um, when he came down, when he, he left and went to Kuwait, for another nine month deployment. Um, When he came back from Kuwait, we immediately got orders to Alaska. So there was no continuation of care. There's no continuity of care. Right. So that got dropped because we were gone. And it wasn't like the doctors were like, hey, Alaska, that you need to med board this guy. So we get to Alaska and things get really hairy. So um, I got pregnant again in Alaska. Well, I got pregnant in Kansas. We lost that baby. Um, And then we get to Alaska and we get pregnant again with Byron, the dragon. Um, And (laughs) and then um, he actually was like, I can't do this anymore. So he's aggressive, angry. Mm -hmm. just hating the world. And a lot of that got taken out on me. It was, um, and of course, because who's the only one saying, please get help. I just, I love you so much. Please get help. Yeah. It's me. So, you know, there was a lot of resentment that was built up because it was like, stop, I'm fine. I'm fine. And it was like, you're not fine. And I just want you to be healthy. And um, while we were in Alaska, I mean, the meds, you know, if you're taking PTSD meds and you have a traumatic brain injury, that affects your brain chemistry. Right. 
and TBI meds are, are more suitable when you have a TBI. <laughs> so, um, I got my, my uncle actually contacted me and was like, Hey, I wrote this paper about the, about the military and about how, um, there's a lax on screening for traumatic brain injuries. And it sounds like what you're going through is exactly what I wrote this about. So I was like, send it. So I remember reading it and going, oh my God, he has a TBI. And so it was like, okay, this is a much more severe TBI than we all thought. You know, we thought this is just, you know, it's fine. But uh, it was more, I was at the more research I did about traumatic brain injuries. I was like, this is what the problem is. This he's irritable. He's got, um, you know, he's impulsive. So it was like, okay, all of these symptoms match versus PTSD. And that's hard because they mirror each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But with PTSD, through counseling and therapy and some medication, you can get better with traumatic brain injury. The way that it was explained to me that I could really understand is, you know, you have a bridge that you go over every day. When you have a trauma, when, when trauma happens to the brain, that bridge is disintegrated. So there is no more pieces. You can't pick anything up. There's no more bridge. It's gone. Right. And so that's where the real advocation on my part started where it was like, okay, you need help, help. And that was the first time that he actually, um, in, in Alaska, he got medication, which you're right. He was, uh, berated for that by his chain of command. It was not good. Um, it was, it was a really, it was really intense in Alaska as much as we loved the, the place. Yeah. Um, where what we were going through was was not easy and um a lot in 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 an overseas duty station and they consider alaska overseas you're only there for three years that's it period the day that you're over you're gone so we finally get you know we finally get this under control we finally start getting him the right medication we finally start talking to people who are like okay this is happening and luckily they had sent him to an outpatient program in Washington state ha huh, where it all happens um but those doctors notice like okay this isn't PTSD this guy something's wrong and then we get orders again mm. So, so at what when year we get the order to, what year is that if you don't mind cuz i uh, what year are we at um 7 or 8 okay. it's all it, it all gets really blurry that's okay <laughs> so um you know yeah <laughs> so we get to um we start getting ready to leave in 2020 the year that everybody you know hates oh, hearing about right. everybody kind of and we literally time. right so um we start leaving 20 or 2019 getting ready to move we literally just missed all the crazy the crazy stuff is traveling so we 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 didn't get covid as we traveled and uh, we got to fort sill oklahoma and that's where like the really dark side happened and um you through all the all the covid shutdowns and restrictions and everything else and um doctors not listening to him at that point where he's like i think i have a tbi i think my wife was right i think i have a tbi um he gets a tbi screening and the doctor goes Haha, yeah you've got a tbi uh so thankfully the doctor was like yeah this is happening and then um he gets a new medications doctor and that doctor is a godsend. That's the doctor who was like, something's wrong. Um, but before that, right before that, he had an episode and um, he attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. So um, 
that was a really and it was a brother in arms that saved him an emt who just happened to have been a former service member showed up so um because i was terrified i didn't know what to do so i called 911 because i was like i need help so thank goodness like an emt showed up and he was a brother in arms so casey so we we keep we're talking about at, because he's he, Stephen is that part of the story, but you have this spouse here. There's and I, I hear like the anger, the outburst, the hiding under the bed. You guys have been moved. Where are you? And now you have a you have two kids. And not physically, not location, not, not location. Where are you? <laughs> yeah, because now Mentally. he's yeah. He's trying to, he's, yeah, he's yeah. attempting suicide now. And I, I mean, are you thinking, how are you, why are you leaving me? Why, what have I not done? Where are, what's your mindset? Oh, all of that, all of it. So I'm just sitting here like for years, I was pretty much in a state of, I felt, I felt like I was in the twilight zone. Nobody's listening. This is happening. How much more can I do for him right now? At this point, he hates me because I'm the only one saying something's wrong. Um, so I was in I was in a really bad place. Um, I was actually wind, wound up being diagnosed after Byron was born, our second son, with major depression because I had gone years feeling like I was crazy. America is the land of the free because of the brave. Norwegian Cruise Line never takes that for granted and is proud to support our troops with a discount program for members of the U.S. military, veterans, reservists, and their spouses. Service members get 10% off their cruise fare, where they'll be met with exclusive onboard experiences as a token of appreciation. NCL's Military Appreciation Program was created for veterans by veterans. Learn more about their military discount and program at ncl.com slash military. That's ncl.com slash military. So How is your physical health too, because I'm we're interrupting cows. How is your physical health? Because I think about caregivers and the stress that caregiver does has on the body because you're not taking, are you taking care of yourself? For a while I was, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, I hiked for a living before I met him Mm -hmm. and I went from being extremely active to completely inactive. So when we got to, yeah, when we got to Fort Sill, when everything happened, um, I think my body had just had enough. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I still have to get up. I still have to take care of two little boys, but it was, I, I was definitely not in a good place. Um, I had self-isolated from, uh, you know, I, I, I don't fit in, in the normal, in the normal sense of the military world. So, um, there was a lot of self-isolation because I didn't, I couldn't find good connections. There are literally two women from the 10 years that he was in the service that I absolutely adore, Mm -hmm. but we weren't in the same places at the same time to talk to them. So, I mean, I had maybe like one, one person to reach out to. And I did go to counseling through all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, it was sporadic. So, no, I was in an awful place. I felt crazy. Um, It took 10 years, 10 years to finally feel like validated. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was awful. (laughs) So you, in your, in your, in the information that you gave us, you said you were officially his caregiver in 21. What does that mean? Why, why do you Um, put that official title on there? Because that's when I, you know, really actually got placed in the role. And (laughs) when I say 2020, I mean, when I started getting paid to, to, to care for him. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? So, uh, I think that's important because most civilians are not going to know what you mean. Like when I, I got paid to care for him. So, well, yeah. So we don't, we don't qualify through the VA for the caregiver program. That's very, um, they're going through a lot over there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually get paid to take care of him through the state. Okay. okay. 
so um, because Stephen has, you know, so he went pretty much 10 years with a TBI undiagnosed, well, diagnosed, but untreated. And when you don't treat a TBI immediately, things progress in a negative way. Right. You it have to count. Be, yeah. So you have to rebuild those pathways as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was rudderless for 10 years mm -hmm. and only using the coping skills and coping mechanisms that he had available to him. Yeah. Right. So um, when I say officially, it's when things turned a corner when the military was no longer like moving around was no longer an, uh, you know, an, an obstacle. Right. Um, when we're finally settled and can get proper care. And um, so, like I said, I'm, I'm paid through the state to, to give him care because like I said, he's pretty much like a dementia. He, he, like it, it, it he can't remember things. He walked out of the, the other, it, he, and, I asked if it was okay for me to say this. He walked out of the house just several months ago without pants on. Mm. Yeah. So it was like, and, and, you know, you, you never want to be that parent or the not parent, but that you never want to be that partner. Who's like, Hey, you're missing your pants. <laughs> so it was, Hey, Hey, uh, you walked out the door without something. You, you want to think about what you're missing? And he was like, I got my hat. I got my, I got my car keys. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and I was how like, old is, how old is Steven? Yeah. Oh, he's 38. That's my thought. He's 38. Yeah. So yeah. And, and being thrust into a role at such a young age, that's hard. Yeah. Knowing like, this is our life. Well, you our life. This is interesting, Kelly, because uh, Kelly, Casey, that's your last name. This is interesting, Casey, because you all ultimately, he gets discharged, medically discharged, and you all decide to move to Virginia. Mm -hmm. right? And that's because it is, yep. and, and that's because you have family there to be able to provide additional support. But the other thing that's so interesting about this, and Jay, we've never talked to anybody about this, is, you know, we talk about sandwich generation uh, caregivers for parents and children, but you're a different kind of sandwich. Your spouse and children, because your your baby nuggets are still children now. Yes. They're they're still children. <laughs> yep. And they're neurodivergent. So right. so yeah. that makes you double caregiver, by the way, because caregivers are also identified with as uh, you know, if they care for individuals who have some level of identified disability because there's more than it's not that there's something wrong with them. It's that there's more than, and it's outside of the traditional, you know, childhood development. And so you're caring for your husband. And I say this respectfully, making sure he's got his pants on. Cause I mean, it, it technically I'm going to say, Casey, I'm going to, I'm going to line up with him on this one. The signs on the store windows only say shirt and shoes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to say, I've always found that odd that they never required pants. I'm going with Steven on this one. So <laughs> pants are optional. And then you've got baby nuggets. That's what I always call kids, baby nuggets. And your baby nuggets have different needs. And then that doesn't even count the 14 chickens because you thought, why not care for a whole <laughs> yep. bunch more? Yeah. Like you are like a caring machine. <laughs> Well, you know, it's actually what's he wanted the chickens, but chickens actually chickens and we also have bees, um, but chickens and bees help um, with sud levels. So um, I can send him if I'm having a really hard day with him and he won't calm down. I can go say, please go talk to the chickens. And it's something in their purring. It's like a cat, but there's something mm -hmm. in their purrs and their little that like suits people wow. so and if i'm really having a hard time i tell him to go sit with the bees because the buzzing of the bees is actually um it, it calms Isn't and it? so it was like go 
go sit with your bees, go check on them, leave me alone. And I'm allergic to bees. So that was a pretty big commitment. <laughs> well, and that's part of your, you know, when I talked about all the different things, you guys are hobby farmers, you are, uh, you're restoring an old farmhouse, you also homeschool. So I'm just like, that is, I'm in awe. But there are all these things, Casey, that, you know, you you had a career before you've put into place to try and get a norm back. And I, I mean, I'm just, first of all, I'm in awe, but there are, there are a lot of things that, that Stephen, I, I guess, you know, we talk about, and I, I know, you know, Stephen has, we up talk about his symptoms. He has outbursts. There are a lot of different things going on with him. How are you coping with that to try and, do you guys, you know, go out? Do you, you know, what, what's marriage look like now, I guess, is the easy thing. Oh, you know, normal. late thirties, what's your marriage? What's your norm? Your normal. I know we're 30, we're, we're in our thirties and it feels like we're in our, you know, sixties. Yeah. But, um, so it's hard. It's hard to balance that because, yeah. you know, it's hard to balance caregiver and wife mm -hmm. and, um, we struggle, but one of the biggest things is <laughs> healing strides has been, a major component in that mm -hmm. um when we found them when i found them they've just come in and and helped fill those gaps mm -hmm. um they don't just take care of steven they don't just take care of me they take care of the boys too mm -hmm. so um you know when i've got i've i've got the kids taken care of but they've provided counseling services for our entire family for free mm -hmm. so um we've gotten into the in into that room and it's about learning to better communicate as a family yeah so that's been essential to our healing especially as a couple because steven doesn't translate some of those things that you know like hey i love you uh but you just stacked all of your clothes in a pile and that's a problem because now I don't know where everything is. I see that you're trying to help, but maybe we can be successful in a different way. So, so nice. <laughs> really good way. Like maybe you can be successful in a different way. And you know, here's the right? thing, because for some people you'd be like, that sounds condescending. No, not remotely condescending. It's called kindness. I mean, you say it's all about voice inflection. And like when you try to help someone, because, you know, it's, it's like the whole, the phrase, you know, never in the history of the his of the world as telling someone to calm down, you know, when exactly. they're not calm has ever worked. I'm not calming down. And so you exactly. have to think about strategies, which has got to be Casey emotionally and physically, like not even physically, the emotional roller coaster and the kind of juggling of, okay, Steven's up because I'm assuming you're on constant supervision of him to, to assess yeah. where his moods and, and where he's at, not literally yeah. just physically, but also emotionally. Yeah. It's hard to leave him. Like, I don't feel safe leaving him at home ever. So mm -hmm. I rely heavily on my poor little neighbors, um, whom we've, you know, their, their family now and, um, nanny camps, <laughs> but, uh, it's really, it is hard. And one of the biggest things is he's on suicide watch all the time. You know, they ask questions when you're going through the process of becoming a caregiver, uh, for, to, to just make the small amount of money to help your family. Mm -hmm. Um, they ask, they'll ask the person with the brain injury, do you know what happens when there's smoke in a room? And they're supposed to say, well, yeah, you like, it's a, it means there's a fire and I should leave. But with someone like Steven, he may say, this is a great opportunity to go out just to end it all. And on a bad day, it could be, I'm just not going to leave today. Mm, yeah. So it's that constant supervision that's, and it's terrifying. And when he's having a bad day there, those are those moments, but that's why, like you said, the way that we talk to each other is so important because even with a dementia patient, like even with somebody who has dementia, they want to go outside or, you know, they say, I have to go home now. 
Yeah. You know, and you you are home, but to them, they're in a state where they may think that they're a child again. And they think, I've got to go see mom and dad, and mom and dad are gone. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, I understand that you want to go home. Um, I really need some help really quick. You know, I need to get, you know, I need to get some dishes out. Would you mind helping me with that before you leave? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, we're now changing the direction and the pattern. So, you know, when Stephen was without pants, hey, would you like to come get your wallet before you go? And, you know, he's sitting here tapping his legs and he goes, oh, I don't have pants on. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you so, this. Let me ask you this. Um, how does how does how does it affect the boys? How has this affected the your relationship with the boys, his relationship with the boys? Because I would say at some level, they are also uh puppy caregivers. They they support him as well. They've learned yes. his, they've learned him as well, and they support, you know, you're not making them be a caregiver, whatever, but right. but they are. How they are. Um, it's hard because I want them to be children. I want them to experience everything that a child can. And I want to shield them from a lot of this. But um, what I can say about my boys, especially after this loss that we've experienced, um, their level of compassion, I've never seen in children their age before. Mm -hmm. Um Harrison is a bit harder. Harrison got to experience a lot of the military. Right. So Harrison has a little more anxiety. He's a little, um, he's a little more cautious. Whereas Byron, Byron just tells it like it is. He lives his life the way a six year old would live. But Byron can bring down the house with his compassion. This child can step into a room and just say, daddy, I see you're having a bad day. You need a hug. Oh. And it's just like, and he, they're just in the room together and they, he just kind of sees the, the, you know, that switch yeah. and he did Dada, Dada, I love you and need a hug. Mm. And Harrison uh, wise beyond his years. So, I mean, if, if I am at the grocery store and I've, you know, the neighbors have got me, Harrison, if the if there's something, Harrison's like, Mom, uh, Dad walked out the door. Oh, okay. So it it it's definitely terrifying. I don't want my children to be scarred by any of this, mm -hmm. but I think we're going in the right direction. Our family mm -hmm. is exceptionally close knit. Mm -hmm. Um and I think that the best thing about my kids and my family is that we lead with love. Mm. So it's never, you know, we, we get frustrated, we fight, <laughs> but I think the biggest thing is that we always lead with love. You know, it's, I love you enough to recognize you're having a bad day. I love you enough to give you the grace and the space to take a minute to breathe and collect your thoughts. And our kids, you know, I, I'm always terrified that something, you know, I'm always terrified we're going to mess them up. Uh, but they are re remarkably compassionate. And I'm just thankful for who they are. I don't want to get emotional. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, it's good. I, no, I know that, like that you, well, you know, I know that you guys recently lost uh, Stephen's stepfather, which was a, you said, you know, a tremendous support. And I worry about you because you are, you have your neighbors for support. Tell me about the support systems that you all have in place or what's, what's missing yeah. and what you feel, because I know you're a big advocate what's missing and, and what veterans, what, uh, discharged, medically discharged, uh, family members, caregivers, what you all need. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's different for each veteran, you know, it's different for each family. Um, I think the biggest thing is connection. Mm -hmm. And I think we are all missing that. Um, especially, you know, COVID decimated 
people's ability to connect. So I think we're all missing that. Um, we've we've been able to find a lot of that, but I think for me as a caregiver, I don't give myself enough time for me. So giving myself time for space and grace, I only get, I get an hour pretty much off and, and that's spent hugging a horse. <laughs> so uh, I, I choose to spend my time literally at healing strides. Is that um, an hour? That's not an hour a day. That's an hour a week. I, what it, a week. That's it's an I'm hour talking. a week. So yeah. The other 157 hours of the day of the week, because there's 158 hours that you know, on your shift, by the way, your yeah. shift is 158 yeah. Yeah. hours um, and the number of hours per week. But you give yourself an hour and oh, and you get to sleep sometimes, right? Yeah, sometimes. Well, I mean, he has nightmares. So yeah, that's I assumed I just thought I'd go ahead and throw that out there. So yeah, I, I really appreciate, you know, it's it is. It is the plight and it is the commonality that we all have, rather it's who, it doesn't matter who you're a caregiver for, it is space and grace for ourselves. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to, it's hard because you, it also comes with a sense of guilt. Like it comes with that sense of guilt. If I take this time for myself, what happens if something happens? Mm. And so it's, it's hard to learn to find a balance and it's hard to find and out and when we were working with just a just our counselor she kept saying casey how can you find your out so i have a big gigantic garden that i go and we've planted and i go into the cut garden and i stroll through the cut garden and i make bouquets and that's what i do to get to do to breathe and I have to make sure to vocalize, okay, mommy is going into the garden today by herself. Mm. So I know that you guys want to be with me, but I'm going to go cut flowers for typically the barn for healing strides by myself. And that's how I get it. Um, that's how I get that space. So I, I'm limited. I don't I don't get as much space as I as I typically need, but I do they know I they know I take timeouts too. Mommy's taking a timeout and I'm going to go and watch a movie on my phone. <laughs> Man, on my phone. <laughs> this is, yeah. I, yeah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, I, I I feel like we could talk to JJ. I feel like we could talk to Casey for like 10 years. <laughs> like there's so much and it's so, I mean, you know, I think you've set yourself up in this environment you know, where you live, you live in rural Southwest Virginia. That's where I'm from. That's how I met Casey. And you set yourself and you're trying to, you've curated. It's interesting. You're curating the environment to try to support, give your husband the best possible environment that supports his needs yes. that he probably doesn't even realize. And from the flowers to the bees, to the chickens, to the, you know, so, you know, with the, the words that you use, you're always on, you are like, you are the reason we did this series. Like you are the hero, Casey, you're a hero too. Your husband, so a hero. Hero. <laughs> you're a hero too. You. And so Jay, we're, I want to move on to sister questions. I hate to move on. I, I want to go out and hang out with the bees, be honest with you. Cause there are some <laughs> days I need some bees for my own mental health. <laughs> so, okay, we'll, we'll lend you the bee suit. <laughs> um, and so okay. Jay, I'm ready. So Casey, for some reason, you are restoring a 1910 farmhouse. In um, free time. So in her free time. So a uh, favorite project so far. Ooh, good one. That's hard. Oh. <laughs> the hallway, probably our hallway. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's what we fell in love with, how we fell in love with the house. Mm -hmm. It's, um, so it's a 1950 or not 19, it's a 1910, but it's a, um, folk Victorian. Mm -hmm. And so the staircase has these gorgeous spindles and, um, we bought this beautiful wallpaper. I'm obsessed with peonies. And so I have <laughs> peony wallpaper. Um, so I just didn't, I loved I loved putting that together and 
it was an easy project too. Hard, but easy. (laughs) Immediate joy. Once you got it done, you were like, my peonies are up. (laughs) I feel like we're going to need photos. We stand in there to take pictures. Yeah, we stand in there to take pictures all the time. Oh. Right now it's got um, witches hats and candles hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. I support that. I now, love it. Definitely have to have photos of the house because that would be fun to put along and add into our posts and on the website. Little so joy. Here's, here's my question. Here's my big question is what is your favorite guilty pleasure? The thing that you do just for yourself, it's only yours. You love it. And you're like, I'm not sharing this with anybody. It's just me. Uh, I want, there's, there's a series on Amazon called wheel of time. Yes. And that's, and that's for me. I kick everybody out and I close the door. (laughs) And I hang out with my cat, uh, my black cat, Max, and I lay in bed and watch it together. Mm, Got that's it. a good series. That's a good yeah. series. Thank you, Netflix. <laughs> Netflix is, has no clue. And I mean, there's other streaming stations, but Netflix, the reality is, is Netflix has no clue how much they support caregivers. That <laughs> yes. My favorite is Hallmark. That is my, that's my <laughs> pleasure. Is, and Jason is like, you know, you want me to tell you how it ends? I'm like, shut it. <laughs> all festival get it so Casey Christmas. I know yeah, right exactly. I, look we are I tried to get on the Hallmark Christmas cruise and two full <laughs> ships sold out and I can tell you they should have called it the Hallmark Christmas caregiver cruise because I was all about bringing my sweaters to the Bahamas and doing you know hot chocolate love and all it. stuff. I love it Casey Thank you so much for being here with us. This was just, and and just giving so much of your most authentic self. You just oh, shared you. so much and we love you. We love Steven. We love the boys, the chickens, the bees, the 15 dogs and cats and all that greatness. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right, guys, until we confess again, thank you so much. <laughs>